All right, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, we are gonna get started right at seven o'clock, but if you are a little bit early, um, feel free to throw in the chat where exactly you're tuning in from. Um, I'd love to hear, uh, this is going to be presented from Reno, Nevada, but I know that we get a lot of people who tune in from across the country um, and across the state. Um, so please uh, throw it in the chat and let me know where you are joining us from. Additionally, in the chat while you're waiting, um, I'm going to be putting in a little flippity link, uh, which you can feel free to click and it has a link that'll take you to a little matching game um, where you can match the name of the woodpecker to its corresponding photo. Um, so this is just kind of getting you a little bit familiar with some of the birds we're gonna be talking about today and maybe working on your woodpecker identification skills. And I'll put that in the chat um, every time we have a couple more people join us. Um, as I don't think it, I don't think you can see that unless you've joined. So I'll go ahead and put the link in the chat again. So once again, I put a link in the chat um, that that will take you to a little matching game that you can play until we get started, um, which we'll get started in just a couple minutes. So sorry, just realized I had the chat turned off. <laughs> All right, I just opened the chat up. Sorry about that. Um, but feel free to put in the chat where exactly you're coming from. And here is that link. Uh, it was closed off. <laughs> but uh, uh, that link can take you to a little uh, card matching game where you can match the name of the woodpecker to the photo, um, the corresponding photo. And it's just a little fun game that you can play while you're waiting for us to get started. And while you're waiting, um, feel free to go ahead and put in the chat where exactly you are tuning in from. I'd love to hear. Here is that link, oh, on direct message. Here is that link one more time for anyone who is just joining us um, for a little card matching game, matching a woodpecker photo to its corresponding name. We're gonna go ahead and get started in just a minute. All right, so it is seven o'clock. So we are gonna go ahead and get started. All right, so this presentation today is titled uh, Wondrous Woodpeckers. So it's gonna be all about different types of woodpeckers and classified within woodpeckers, we also have a bird called sapsuckers, which I'm kind of gonna talk uh, touch on today. 
So before we get started, let's make sure that we are being appropriate in the Q&A and in the chat. Um, anything that is inappropriate, um, you might get removed from this presentation or uh, your, have your chat privilege, privileges disabled. Um, other things to take account of, um, if you wish to use the chat feature, um, that you'll find that either at the bottom of your screen on some computers, it is at the top of the screen. Um, and you can use the chat uh, to respond to general questions. Um, if I ask a question, feel free to respond using the chat box. Um, additionally, there is the Q&A box. So if you have a question for me, um, you can feel free to put them in the Q&A and uh, at the end I'll address them or perhaps throughout, throughout it, I'll address some of your uh, questions with answers. So to practice using our chat feature, um, what is your favorite bird? Go ahead and put it in the chat and let me know what your favorite bird is. Um, personally, I think mine right now at least is going to be cedar waxwings. Um, they, there's been a ton of them that have been migrating through Reno. Um, I work out of Oxbow Nature Study Area, and there are a ton that have been hanging around eating the olives off of the Russian olive trees. Um, and just, they're really ple pleasant to look at, really pretty birds. Um, it looks like Caitlin says that her osprey are her favorite bird. Osprey are pretty cool. I love the way that they hold on to their fish. They hold it kind of di where it's uh, facing forward to make it more aerodynamic. All right, so moving on. So today we are going to be discussing uh, the adaptations of our woodpeckers. So what exactly makes them special? We're going to touch on this different species that we have here in Nevada. And we're also going to discuss why exactly woodpeckers are important. Why should we care about them? Um, and we'll, we'll go further into that later. <laughs> um, so starting off with feeding. So they have a ton of adaptations that allow them to be able to obtain their food. They eat a mixed diet. So they don't only eat insects. Um, a lot of their diet is going to, a lot of woodpeckers are going to specialize on insects. Um, however, other, uh, they will feed on other things such as sap, uh, nuts, seeds. Um, in this case, we have an acorn woodpecker um, up in this upper right hand corner. And that acorn woodpecker is uh, storing acorns in a tree. So they have a ton of adaptations that allow them to be able to um, obtain their food and even store it. Um, so sap suckers, that's this photo that we have over on the left hand side. Um, sap suckers will drill into trees uh, shallowly. So just past the top, um, top of the bark. And this will create, encourage sap to flow through it. Um, and they will stick their tongues out going into that. They will stick their tongues out. Um, sorry. They will stick their tongues out into these holes um, to uh, suck up some of that sap. Um, but it's not necessarily sucking. They're more so sticking their tongue out and absorbing that sap onto their tongue. Um, using capillary action, which I'll kind of go into a little more when I discuss their tongue. So their skull and beak has to be highly adapted to be able to withstand all of the shock that their, uh, that their brain is going to or could. Uh, woodpeckers have evolved to have a very unique skull that allows them to be able to protect their brain while they're drilling away at trees to obtain their food. Um, they can drill up to 20 times per second. However, when they are doing a drill session, typically it's not for food, but it is to make noise to attract a mate. Um, a lot of times when spring comes around, woodpeckers will like to uh, kind of bang their head on metal chimneys because um, they like that noise that it makes. Uh, it resonates really loud. And although we don't really like it, it sounds really, really cool to the females and they're definitely attracted to that. So a drill event can last anywhere from a quarter of a second to 1.8 seconds long. Um, and these are going to be mating drills. And when they are trying to find insects, 
they are going to be tapping on the surface of the bark and listening to whether or not it's hollow underneath. Um, they're going to be tap, tap, tapping lightly across the surface. And if they do hear that it is hollow, they assume that there is a bug within it um, and they'll drill past that top bark to obtain the um, bug. So this is what a drill session kind of sounds like. Oh, why is my, well, my audio is not working for some reason. Well, it's uh, typically a repeated tap, 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 tap um, for a couple of seconds or for up to 1.8 seconds long. So some other things to take into account, some other adaptations that are special about their skull and their beak. Um, so their brains are going to be tightly packed within that skull, and that's to prevent it from rattling around. It also has less folds um, and less cerebral spinal fluid, and this means that there's less medium uh, for shock to be able to travel through on its way to the skull. Now you can see um, the beak is going to direct that shock as it's hitting the for as it's hitting the bark, um, as it's hitting the tree, that shock is going to be directed up over its head and down below its jaw towards um, its neck. And that's to help protect its brain. Um, within their brain, they're going to have, or within their skull, they're going to have this cancellous bone. And this cancellous bone es essentially acts as though it is a sponge absorbing that shock um, from the drilling session. Now you can see on the skull on the right hand side, it has a double layered beak. So this outer layer is going to be more flexible. Um, it reduces shock. And then the under layer is gonna be that bone. Um, and the positioning is done so that the lower jaw, the bone is a little bit uh, longer than the top jaw. And that's so more of this force is channeled down its neck um, instead of being up and towards its brain. Um, cancellous bone is known to reduce the stress of their drilling sessions from anywhere um, from two to eight times. So it definitely does take a number off of uh, a number off of their brain. It would be very intense uh, if their brain did not have all, all of these protections in place to keep it from being rattled around. Now, moving on from their uh, brain, we get to their tongue. So I was mentioning earlier how the sap sucker um, doesn't necessarily suck the sap out of trees, but instead its tongue absorbs um, that sap. So you can see it has these little barbs on the, end of its tr uh, of, on the end of its tongue. And those barbs will, kind of like a napkin when it gets put in water, it just absorbs, it fills up using capillary action. Um, it sucks in that sap, which it then brings back into, or absorbs that sack, sap. And then it brings its tongue back into its mouth um, to suck that sap off of its tongue. Now, these tongues can also be barbed, which is helpful when they're trying to remove um, bugs from inside their, the holes. You can see um, up on this uh, right-hand corner, there is a northern flicker. Now, the northern flicker has the longest tongue out of all of the flickers, um, extending about two, two inches past its beak. Um, so it might look like it's a little bit longer in this photo, um, but it's not. It's only about two inches past its beak. Um, these tongues are very helpful, like I said, for um, collecting sap and collecting bugs. Um, the tongue will attach through the right nostril. So they have this, it basically wraps all the way around and they can, ex that's how they extend it. it um, as it goes out, it's going to kind of move. So moving on to their next adaptation, which is climbing. So their adaptations for climbing. Um, they have an extremely stiff set of tail feathers and they use these tail feathers as a prop um, to aid them in climbing trees. So they don't necessarily have to hold themselves up with their feet the entire time. They can lean back um, and take some and relax a little bit um, by resting on that, those back tail feathers. Another adaptation they have is, are these zygodactyl feet. 
So their feet um, have two toes that are facing forward and two toes that are facing backwards. Most birds are going to have three toes facing forward and one toe kind of facing backwards. Um, and that's really good for gripping stuff. They have a tendon that when they go to sit, um, it closes that foot. Um, this foot is different. Instead, it aids in them climbing. Um, it's thought that it helps them lean back further, which is helpful when they're trying to drill. And it also provides them uh, an extra set of like support. So instead of just leaning back on one toe, they're leaning back on two. That is what is assumed. Now, there are some woodpeckers, however, um, they're called three-toed woodpeckers and they're really unique. They only have these three toes. Um, th this is going to include the American three-toed woodpecker and the black-backed woodpecker. Originally, there, we thought that there was just one uh, three-toed woodpecker species um, because the European version and the American version are extremely similar. Um, visually, they're pretty much you, like exactly the same. However, they have unique DNA and unique uh, vocalizations. So because of this, we have classified them as two separate species, even though if you put them next to each other, you might not be able to tell. But the ones that we have here in Nevada, um, and the only other two that are around, as far as I know, um, are the American three-toed woodpecker and the black-backed woodpecker, which you have both of here in Nevada. So we are going to go into some of our birds that we have here. So what woodpeckers do we have here in Nevada? Well, um, go over a little bit about animal classification. So our woodpeckers are going to be in the kingdom of Animalia, which is animals. Um, they are in the phylum chordate, which means that they have a vertebrae. Aves is birds. Thickiformes um, is woodpeckers. And I think it also includes like toucans. And then Picadae is going to be our woodpeckers specifically and our um, sapsuckers. So there are six different genuses um, that we have here in the state. And that's how I'm gonna kind of go through them is one genus at a time. So we are going to start off with our dryobates. So starting off with our ladder-backed woodpecker, um, these were once known as the cactus woodpecker. They like to live in Southern Nevada. They're found in uh, only really in Southern Nevada. Um, they enjoy hanging out in deserts, kind of that scrubland habitat. Um, they will nest in cacti. And sometimes they could be found in pinyon juniper forests. Um, however, they do tend to hang out more so in the desert. Now, our next one we're gonna talk about is our downy woodpecker. And you might notice that our downy woodpecker and our hairy woodpecker uh, look really, really similar. And the biggest difference between them is going to be size. Um, oh, and on the ladder-backed woodpecker, the best way to identify it is going to be that kind of barred back. It has that ladder back um, when comparing it to these other two woodpeckers. And this also extends to kind of its wings are going to be a little more of this kind of barring. Now, our downy woodpecker and our hairy woodpecker, one way to tell them apart is going to be their uh, tails. So the downy woodpecker has some spotting on it. However, the biggest, uh, the best way I think to tell if you don't have them both sitting right next to each other is going to be their beak to head ratio. So the downy woodpecker is going to have a shorter beak um, and the hairy woodpecker is gonna have a longer beak when compared to their heads. Um, another thing is that the downy woodpecker is going to be smaller. Um, the hairy woodpecker is larger, um, which you can kind of tell in this photo. Um, on the right, we have our hairy woodpecker. And on the left over here, we have a um, downy woodpecker. And these are both females. You can tell because they don't have that red patch on their head. Now, uh, talking about our downy woodpecker, they they're found uh, throughout Nevada. However, they tend to be more common in the northern half. However, they, they can definitely be found throughout Nevada. They like to hang out in open woodlands. Um, I find them along the Truckee River all of the time. They like to hang out near streams um, in uh, along the cottonwood trees. They are small enough that they can feed on cattails and reeds and such. So they tend to hang out near wetlands. Um, and this is because they're smaller. Um, so they're able to reach that niche that the hairy woodpecker isn't able to reach because the hairy woodpecker is too big. So you won't catch them 
um, hanging out on cattails and reeds. Um, the hairy woodpecker is found throughout Nevada, except really in the southernmost portion. Uh, and all, oh, and, and the hairy woodpecker also really likes to live in um, burned areas, uh, burned habitat. So freshly burned forests are prime habitat for a lot of our woodpeckers that we're going to be discussing about today, um, because these burned habitats tend to have a lot of nesting or a lot of cavities. Um, they attract a lot of bugs. Um, which are perfect food for our woodpeckers. Here's that photo once more, comparing the uh, hairy woodpecker to the downy woodpecker. So our next one um, we're gonna talk about is the white-headed woodpecker. So the white-headed woodpecker is found in the westernmost, uh, in the western portion of Nevada. I have seen them out at Tahoe. Um, they like to hang out uh, near ponderosa pines and sugar pines. They will eat the seeds out of the cones. So they will use their beaks, their drilling abilities to pound into pine cones to remove the seeds that are hiding within them. Um, so their drilling abilities help them beyond just obtaining insects. Um, and they will also collect sap just like our sap suckers do by, collect, by making sap wells, um, which I'll define when we get to our sap suckers. Now our next species is Dryocopus. So Dryocopus, or our next genus, sorry, our next genus is Dryocopus. And this species is, I think, the only one in this genus, um, and that is the pileated woodpecker. So it gets this, their name from this uh, little pileated head that they have, their little uh, mohawk they got going. You can identify a male versus a female because the male will have that red cheek patch compared to the females. Um, she, she doesn't have that. She has a lack of a white wood patch. Um, they can be found in uh, the Sierra Nevadas along the western portion of Nevada, um, sometimes around Tahoe. They like mature woodlands, so they like uh, old growth forest. And they're kind of unique uh, when they're drilling for bugs and stuff, they will drill rectangular, like kind of rectangular-ish um, looking holes instead of circle ones. And, uh, and when they are nesting for, when they're making their nest, the male will drill more of like an oblong kind of um, entrance instead of a perfectly circ circular one. A lot of our woodpeckers will make perfect circles um, and this one will make one that's more kind of like an egg shape. Which is one way that you can identify um, that this woodpecker has made a nest. Um, they are highly defensive and they do not, as far as I know, they do not migrate and they'll hang out and defend their territory year round. Um, our next one is Oh, I don't think I looked up how to pronounce this one. Um, Colapes. We're going with Colapes. Um, and this is the genus of the gilded flicker and the red shafted northern flicker. So both of our flickers, as you can see, they look pretty similar. And originally they were classified as one species. Um, the red shafted northern flicker is just a subspecies of the northern flicker. So the northern flicker includes both the red shafted, which we get in the west, and the yellow shafted, which we get on the east. Um, here in Nevada, we typically only get the red shafted northern flicker. However, they have been known to hybridize with one another. Um, and sometimes we do occasionally get the one off uh, yellow shafted looking northern flicker. However, there are kind of like a variation um, so some of them can look kind of orangish instead of purely yellow or purely um, red. The gilded flicker was also considered a northern flicker um, for a while. Uh, however, I think because it was so ge it was more so geographically isolated compared to the other flickers that it was kind of considered um, its own species. So the Gilded flicker tends to only hang out in southern Nevada, uh, way down south in the Mojave Desert. As you can see in this photo, it likes to hang out on cactuses. Um, and it will specialize just like the northern flicker does, mainly on ants. Um, however, it'll also eat some like fruits and seeds. Um, and both of these can be found commonly kind of scanning the ground, uh, looking for ant, ant hills that they can get to. 
uh, the red shaft of northern flickers tongue is extremely helpful when obtaining their favorite food, which is ants, um, because that tongue is able to descend into that hole um, and the ants will go towards it trying to attack it and it will just swallow them up. Um, the red shaft of northern flicker is found throughout Nevada and is very common. Um, I see them all the time here in Reno. Um, and you can commonly hear them calling. I would play the sound. However, I'm going to kind of um, do an awful job at imitating it. Um, it's kind of like a yeah, yeah. And if you hear that, um, that's probably a northern flicker uh, getting or expressing itself um, probably towards the top of a tree. So one of the best ways to identify whether or not you're looking at a northern flicker or a gilded flicker is going to be that um, Oh, she says that I might be able to hit share computer sound. Oh, let's see if this works. I don't know if it's working. Well, if it works, oh, it worked, great. So that is the sound of the red shafted Northern Flicker. Um, and they will make this noise as they're hanging out uh, near the tops of trees um, to let others know that they're around. Um, so the best way to tell whether or not it is a gilded flicker or a red shafted northern flicker is the red shafted northern flicker is going to have those red shafts on its feathers and the gilded flicker is gonna have more of kind of this golden yellow look. So moving on to our next woodpecker and our next genus, uh, which is Melanerpes. So Melanerpes has the genus uh, or has the Gila woodpecker and the Gila woodpecker is tends to be found. Uh, oh, I moved my notes too soon. Uh, tends to be found way down south. Uh, it likes to hang out in uh, the Chola, Chola, I might be saying that wrong, uh, cactuses. And they're really found more so in like the southernmost tip of Nevada. Uh, as far as I know, they're not really common, um, but they will, let me get resituated. Yes, um, so they will eat insects as well as fruits off of cacti, um, and they will nest in the saguaro cactuses um, as well, or cacti as well. Um, so that's where they prefer to, they are commonly are known to make their nests in. So moving on to our acorn woodpecker and our next family, which is Melanerpes. Moving on from Melanerpes, still on Melanerpes, um, is our acorn woodpecker. So our acorn woodpecker um, is found in the western westernmost portion of Nevada, um, in the Sierra Nevadas. Um, they tend to live in pine oak woodlands, as their name would suggest. They do like the acorns off of the oak trees. Um, they are really cool. They have adapted to form these granaries. Um, that's what these trees are called, where they will drill holes across them um, to store their acorns. Now they'll store their acorns over time. Um, and as, they, as the acorn begins to dry up, they'll go from acorn to acorn testing it. Um, and if it, be, if it shrivels up and it's too small for its hole, they'll move it to another hole where it's a little more snug um, until the cap eventually comes off of it and they can eat what's inside. They'll store these, um, especially, which is really helpful for winter time. Um, it provides them with food when there might not be a lot available. Um, and they'll also eat things like fruit and sap and nectar. Um, occasionally, they are known to raid the nests of other birds and even eat um, things like lizards. And they have a really unique social structure. So our acorn woodpecker tends to live in groups with multiple breeding females and sometimes multiple breeding males as well. Um, so they have this weird kind of initiation before they settle down and raise their eggs. So one, uh, they'll have one, net, one cavity that they use for nesting and other cavities will be used for brooding at night. So that's where they'll go to sleep. Um, but that, that cavity they're using, using for nesting, all of the females will use one nest. So one female will come and she will lay her egg and then she will fly away. And the next female will come when she is uh, fertilized and ready to lay, to lay an egg and she'll destroy that egg that was laid beforehand. And then she'll leave. 
and or she'll lay her egg and then leave. And then a third female will come along and destroy that egg and then lay her own egg. And this cycle will continue until all of the females are breeding. So that way all of the eggs can be raised together as one unit um, that are hatching around the same time because they've only been, because they've all been laid at the same time. Um, so they have this communal nest and it's really odd to see this. Not a lot of birds uh, kind of have this social structure. Our next bird is the Lewis woodpecker. Um, so the Lewis woodpecker can be found throughout Nevada, uh, live in Ponderosa forests and newly burned forests. Um, they'll also store acorns. However, they tend to do it more so in just the crevices of trees. They don't do this whole fancy making a granary thing. Um, they'll also so store grains and seeds in crevices of trees um, so that they can eat uh, them throughout the fall and the winter. Um, another special thing about the Lewis woodpecker is that they do not make their own nest. Um, they are secondary cavity nesters, which is one of the most important reasons why we have woodpeckers in the first place is because they are making that habitat for our secondary cavity nesters. So they'll make a nest or make a cavity, have their own nest, and then another bird can come around the next year and use that cavity um, as their own nest. So that's what a secondary nester or secondary cavity nester is. Um, one notable species that I'm just kind of mentioning, we don't typically have these here in Nevada, uh, the red-headed woodpecker. However, one has surprisingly made its way um, over the Rockies uh, and into Nevada. Um, typically they're found on the, along the Eastern portion of the US. However, we do have one that's been hanging around uh, near Virginia City as of late, which is pretty wild, uh, but sometimes we do get the odd bird that just makes its way through. So super exciting for birders. Um, our next one we're gonna talk about is our three toed woodpeckers, uh, the Picadies. So starting off with our black-backed woodpecker, um, the black-backed woodpecker is found in the western portion of Nevada. Um, so typically along, think like Tahoe up into the Sierra Nevadas. Um, they are, both of these two are heavily de are dependent on burnt forest. So that burnt forest, um, a lot of wood beetles will come to burn, newly burned forests to begin to bore into it, to raise, like to multiply, basically. It's this perfect habitat for these beetles. And that means that it's perfect food for our black-backed woodpeckers. Um, our our black-backed woodpecker and our three-toed uh, woodpecker. Um, so sometimes uh, our black-backed woodpecker has even been known to leave its normal range uh, to move to areas that have been burned uh, to eat those bugs. So sometimes it'll go uh, just like our redheaded woodpecker did, um, where it typically doesn't go just to take advantage of that food. Um, they specifically really focus on the uh, larvae, the grubs of the wood boring and the bark beetles, um, and they'll spend a lot of time uh, focused on just eating. So they'll hang out on one tree for long periods of time, um, trying to get as much of the grubs out of that tree as possible. Um, on our American three-toed three woodpecker, so they don't typically, they're not very common throughout Nevada. Um, we do have a population that does live in uh, Great Basin National Park though. Um, so you can find them in Great Basin National Park and in some places along the eastern side of, the, of Nevada. Um, however, they are kind of rare. Um, they just as well really rely on dead trees um, for food because that's where those uh, bark beetles are going to be trying to drill into those wood boring beetles. Um, so they do rely on burned forest. Um, and they'll also uh, create sap wells that they'll drink nectar from as well. Um, and they will also, just like the blackback woodpecker, target a tree and just keep trying, determined to get all of the, the, uh, the larvae out of that tree. All right, so our, now we are moving on to our sapsuckers. Um, so on our sapsuckers, oh, my alarm is going off. So starting off with our sapsuckers, we, um, this is in the genus Spiricus, I'm pretty sure I said that right, Spiricus. 
Um, and it starts off with the Williamson sap, sap sucker. So they are found year round um, in Western Nevada and are known to uh, leave Western Nevada to go breed in Eastern Nevada. Um, they tend to be found higher up in elevations. Uh, they like to feed on sap. Um, that's what all of these sap suckers do. So, uh, but they'll, they'll kind of have different patterns, different methods of going about it. Our Williamson sap sucker will drill uh, rings of, uh, so circles, but we'll drill them in kind of ring formation. Um, and that's how you can tell that a Williamson sap sucker has been making those sap wells. And after it removes kind of that first layer of bark, the sap will go down and collect. And other things love to feed on that sap as well. Um, the bugs that are around will go and try to eat that sap. And that is just extra food for our sap suckers to consume. Um, it's just an extra added bonus. They're able to lure some food as well as uh, eat the sap as well. Um, other things might be attracted to the sap wells of the sap suckers. Um, things like other squirrels. So squirrels definitely will try to um, eat the sap off of the trees um, and also hummingbirds. Hummingbirds uh, will go around looking for sap wells that they can uh, collect some sap from because it's just basically sugar, um, which is the hummingbird's favorite meal. Um, a lot of our sap suckers will also uh, be able to fly um, off of trees to be able to catch insects in midair, um, so they're not going to be drilling for bugs as much. Um, the male and the female of the Williamson sap sucker will build their nest together, so they will drill out a nest together. Um, one way to identify a sap sucker from a woodpecker is that a sap sucker is going to have kind of these white bars. Um, all of the sap suckers have this. And here we have a Williamson sapsucker female. So you can see that she's kind of got this brown head um, compared to the others, other females, which typically have the same coloration, but just lack the red coloration. Uh, moving on to our red-breasted sapsucker. Um, so they're found in the western and south and along along the western side to the southern portion of Nevada. Um, and they'll hang out over winter in these areas um, and some will are actually are will they will hang out along western Nevada down into southern Nevada and they'll also breed as well in uh, western Nevada uh, not typically so much in southern Nevada um, the red-breasted sapsucker will breed in coniferous forests um, and it likes to eat sap fruit and bugs um, the red naped sapsucker. Yeah, the red na uh, nape sapsucker will migrate through Nevada, um, wintering in the southern portion of Nevada and moving up north to the northern portion. Um, and instead of drilling uh, circles to make their sap sap wells, they're going to be drilling horizontal rows of more rectangular holes. So their holes are not going to be circular like the other. Um, like the Williamson's or the red sap, red bested sapsucker, they're going to be drilling more rectangular holes in lines. Um, so sapsuckers are very important because they do provide food for our hummingbirds, um, as well as a sweet treat for our bugs and other uh, mammals. Um, so here we have our sapsucker female again. And then this is a red naped sapsucker female. Um, do I not have, yeah, okay. So uh, the mainly the way to tell a red nape sapsucker female from a red naped male um, is that it has a patch of white. So this one's not as bright and obvious. It's not just missing the red color. Um, it just basically has this patch of white and that's how you're able to tell it is a female um, red nape sapsucker. So why exactly are our woodpeckers important? Why do we care about them? Well, they are considered a keystone species. So a keystone species is basically a species that is able to impact the environment in a way that impacts many different animals. Um, so our, because they are able to make those cavity nests, 
they are able to provide habitat for so many other species of birds. Um, we have a ton of owls that will use um, holes in these uh, crevices to nest, these cavities to nest in. Um, we also have things like our uh, the mountain bluebird, which is our state bird. They are, they're also they are also secondary cavity nesters. And then we also have our flying squirrel, um, which is native to Nevada. Um, and they will use the cavities uh, to raise their own young in to winter in um, as well. And woodpeckers are able to decimate up to 98% uh, percent of all bark beetles in a certain area if conditions are just right. Um, so if we did not have these woodpeckers, our forests would probably be decimated by bark beetles by now. Um, so because we have them, because they do such a number on eating a, a, a huge number of our bark beetle larvae before they even become full adults, um, they are containing a problem that we don't even know could be a, like we don't even it's not even a problem because they exist, because they are doing this free ecological service for us. Um, but if they weren't around um, and these beetles were to get out of control, they could easily decimate forests across the United States. So woodpeckers are so important just because of their ability to consume bark beetles and provide uh, nests for other birds to, or cavities for other birds to nest in. So our secondary cavity nesters. Now, if you would like to attract woodpeckers, um, right now there is a bit of a salmonella outbreak um, occurring in the Western portion of the United States. So we do advise um, holding off on putting out our bird feeders just a little while longer um, to hopefully get this salmonella, um, all of the cases to kind of die off. As far as I know, it has, it does look like it has been going down. Um, however, we are still asking um, please to keep your, uh, your bird feeders down just until uh, it, we know for sure that it has passed. Um, but otherwise, if you do wish to attract uh, woodpeckers, they do like uh, bird feeders that they can scale the side of because um, they do have those uh, zygodactyl feet. So grabbing things uh, and perching on them the way that our perching birds do, it's a little more awkward for our woodpeckers. Um, so they like to use these suet feeders that they can just kind of hang off of the side. Um, a lot of our woodpeckers are very um, attracted to suet. They love to eat it. Um, if you also want to provide water for our woodpeckers, they tend to provide or tend to prefer more floor level water. Um, so they're not gonna really go for bird baths sometimes. Um, they're gonna prefer, prefer more natural looking sources of water that are low to the ground. Um, and if you do want, and just, it, it makes it better always when the water is flowing. So if you can add some sort of pump or little fountain to that, um, that just kind of indicates freshness to a bird. Um, but there are definitely responsibilities. If you are going to be feeding our birds, you should make sure that you're feeding, uh, you're cleaning out your feeders every one to two weeks um, more if it has been wet um, and that you are cleaning it out uh, with one part vinegar to nine parts water solution. Um, I tend to just kind of have a bucket of this that I will dunk my feeder in whenever I am, uh, whenever I notice it's empty and I need to replace it, um, which typically is like every, two to three days because of how much I tip the, the birds just love my feeders. Um, but they are down right now, so I do miss my birds. Another way that you can attract your birds to your backyards um, are by providing birdhouses and shelters. So some birds um, are, some of our woodpeckers are just not going to use um, birdhouses. Uh, they prefer cavities and they can kind of tell the difference. However, things like flickers, um, which are commonly the birds that we will have problems with um, because they do like to drill on, um, fences, uh, they'll drill on chimneys that are metal. Um, sometimes they'll try to build cavities in the sides of people's houses. It has been shown that if you just put a woodpecker nest like right next to the hole that it's making, it'll choose the woodpecker box instead of making its own nest because it's, it's too lazy. It would much rather use your nice box that you provided for it. You can also plant native oak trees um, in your yard to encourage acorn loving species. If you are in the westernmost portion of the United, or if, of the westernmost portion of Nevada, um, or somewhere else in the United States where you have wood, acorn woodpeckers, um, and because they they do prefer uh, holes that are higher up. 
um, they typically, if they drill them themselves, they'll drill their holes no lower than six feet. Um, this keeps it out of reach of things like predators. Um, and so the, if you want to simulate this, you should put your bird houses up six uh, to 20 feet up in the air um, to encourage woodpecker use. Um, every year you should be cleaning out this box if it has been used um, to prevent the spread of disease. All right, so that is the end of my presentation today. Um, as you exit, you will notice that a, a little link for a survey will pop up. Um, I do appreciate if you were to fill out that survey. Um, it lets me know how I did. It lets me know if there's any pr programs you are all interested in um, or any suggestions you have on how to make the presentation better. I am going to be putting in the chat one more time that Flippity, um, and that Flippity is a link that will lead you to um, a little matching game. Oh, my link was private. There we go. Um, and that link will take you to a little card matching game where you can match the name of the woodpecker to a photo of the woodpecker. Um, so this way you can kind of work on your own woodpecker identification skills um, in a little bit of a fun way. So I will go ahead and take any questions um, if you have them now. And if you don't have any now, but you do think of some later, or maybe you just wanna shoot me a message and talk about woodpeckers, feel free to send me an email uh, that's down below. Once again, my name is Amanda and I hope you all really enjoyed this presentation. I will hang around just a couple more minutes to see if anyone has any further questions. All right, well, it looks like we don't have any further questions. Oh, someone said, is there rehab centers in Nevada for woodpeckers? Um, so we do have a few rehab, rehab, like individual rehabbers that live throughout Nevada um, that we contract out with and that we send our birds to if, uh, or we work with um, and we send our birds to if, are, if they are injured. Um, I know that, yeah, most of the people that we go through, um, we can put you in contact um, with a rehabber. So yes, there are rehab centers. Oh, another great way that you can help woodpeckers um, just by helping all birds really is by putting um, little reflective, some people put like UV reflective um, stickers on your windows. And this just helps birds know that there is a window there um, so that they don't try to fly through it. Um, it. Window strikes are one of the more common injuries that birds get just going off of like rehab centers. Cause I was kind of thinking like, how would a woodpecker hurt itself? Probably by flying into a window. Cause that's, that's more, the most common um, for our smaller birds. That's the most common injury that they'll get. Are there tree drilling good for trees? So they don't injure the tree. Um, a lot of times when they're harvesting the sap, like specifically for sap suckers, they'll use that tree multiple times, uh, multiple years in a row. Um, and it's just like how we do when we're harvesting like sap or maple from trees. Um, we're not necessarily hurting the tree. We're just putting little holes in it and collecting the sap from within it. Um, as for drilling in to get insects, um, a lot of the a lot of the woodpeckers aren't going to be drilling very deep past the surface. Um, they're just going to be drilling just past the bark to where those insects are underneath. So they don't tend to drill very deep. Um, I think it was the pileated woodpecker is the one that drills the deepest and has been known to make rather large holes. Let me see. I think I took a note of it. Um, Yeah, one of them is uh, has been known to to actually take down trees um, with the the density of their like with the size of their holes.
I want to say I want to say it was the pileated woodpecker. Yeah, it makes deep and rectangular holes. So really, really deep rectangular holes um, that can be a foot or more wide um, and just as deep. So these have been known to take down trees. Um, however, uh, most of the other woodpeckers don't tend to do this. Um, and even in the in the pileated woodpecker, it only does this on occasion um, when they are really determined to get to the bugs within the tree. Um, however, if you think about long term effect, um, if the if they weren't drilling in to get those bark beetle larvae, um, the trees in the long term would definitely suffer um, as the bark beetles do tend to suck the nutrients out of the trees um, and kill them off. So in the long run, it's, I think, better for them to be drilling into the trees um, just on the surface to obtain those grubs rather than um, have the woodpeckers not do it at all. And then the grubs get out of control. Great question. All right, we'll give it one more minute and see if anyone else has any questions. All right, well, it looks like we don't have any further questions, but as I said, feel free to send me an email um, if you do have any questions um, and I can answer them, um, or if you have any suggestions about any future presentations you'd like to see, I will definitely uh, look at it and see what I can do. All right, well, I hope everyone has a nice day, or I guess wonderful night since it is nighttime now. So <laughs> good night, everyone. <laughs>